So, so we were starting this new session. Uh, uh, first talk by Professor Nakayama, talk about the past for the Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. It's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to speak. And whenever I visit Taiwan, it's my great pleasure to present my name in Chinese characters like this. And the story is that um, uh, one of your greatest leaders visited Tokyo some time ago, and he saw a name tag of this family name somewhere in Tokyo, and he was very impressed by its symmetry. And he even changed his name <laughs> to Sun. And now uh, you can find this family name everywhere in Taiwan, and I feel very happy. <laughs> and, and I'm talking about the symmetries in GFP, particularly its relations to uh, very peculiar anomalies, great anomalies. So let me begin. So cohomal symmetry has been a very powerful tool to understand many interesting physical phenomena, such as the physical phenomena. And for example, by using the recently developed technique of conformal bootstrap, you can compute uh, the critical exponents very precisely. And one of the elementary facts about conformal symmetry is that it determines the form of many correlation functions. For example, we learn in textbooks that two-point functions and three-point functions are completely determined or fixed by the conformal symmetry. One, one thing here is that uh, this condition, conditions of the two-point function and three-point function is actually the same in two dimensions and a higher dimension. I'm talking about the higher dimensional CFT in this talk, but the condition is actually the same. And that's stronger, even though you have an infinite three-dimensional real solo symmetry in two dimensions. Because actually the local part of real solo symmetry is always spontaneously broken in two dimensions. So there is no further constraint in two dimensions. The condition is the same. And we use these facts about the uh, two-point function and three-point functions to do the bootstrap, conformal bootstrap, for higher point functions like four-point functions. And let me continue uh, the properties of conformal field theory that you may know or you may not know. So as I said, in conformal field theory, the two-point functions of primary operators are completely fixed. And they are non-zero only when the conformal dimensions of the operators in solid are the same. So this is the usual formula you have. And this is stronger than the just scale symmetry, because in the scale symmetry... The, well, that's uh, not true when there is spectrum charge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if you have all this scalar symmetry, the dimension of these two operators does not have to be the same. But if you have conformal symmetry, special conformal symmetry, then the dimension of this operator, delta 1 and delta 2, must be the same, or at least scalar operators. And, and, and this is the chronological delta here. And this is what we learned in textbook. But there is something that you might not familiar with. There is a Further possibility to have a non zero two point functions. And indeed, if you have delta functions on the right hand side, they can be non zero, even if the dimension delta one is not equal to dimension delta two. So, suppose you have the delta functions or the two point functions in conformal field theory. Obviously, the dimension delta one. And the dimension, the sum of the dimension delta 1 and the dimension of delta 2 must be equal to d because you have the uh, delta function here, which has dimension d here. But other than that, there is no constraint actually. The delta 1 can be different from delta 2 to have non zero contact term or delta functions on the right hand side. <coughs> And, 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 and this is quite different from the non-local case, where the delta 1 must be equal to delta 2. And having these kind of examples, you may be worried. If you have more complicated amplitudes, complicated correlation functions, it's not that obvious whether or what would be the most uh, constraining conditions that you would have from the conformal symmetry. For example, Suppose you have this kind of three-point functions with delta functions with derivatives, 
any of these uh, non local scaling factors, are they consistent with conformal invariance or are they not? It's not that easy to determine. And, and, and okay, so to explain the terminology, when I say semi local terms, well, if you have only data functions, it is essentially, it is also called the contact terms. And if you have a combination of delta functions and other non-local scaling functions, we sometimes call them semi-local terms. And having said that, you might ask, why do we have to care? Why do we have to care contact terms? <coughs> well, this is a very legitimate question because in many situations, one may eliminate these uh, contact terms and local terms in correlation functions by using or by adding the local counter terms to your effective action. In that case, these are not a universal observable in CFT, so they are not very important objects to be studied in CFTs. But in other situations, there are symmetry constraining. Constra con see, there is a symmetry that forbids to add these contact terms. And in these cases, you cannot remove these contact terms, or any local terms, from the correlation functions, and they are are unambiguous observables in the theory. Let me show you a couple of examples here. Uh, well, and there, the most important and physically relevant contact terms in CFTs are the one that appears in the word identities or anomalies that I would like to discuss in this talk. And they are all in this category. So, so let me take a look at this anomalous uh, or uh, usual conservation law in conformal field theory. So all the identities. So on the left hand side, we have a divergence of the current. Classically, it must vanish, but in quantum field theories, there is a non zero term on the, right, on the right hand side as a delta function with some transformed operators inside it here. And this gives you uh, sometimes uh, contact terms, sometimes this gives you uh, semi local terms, and you are not allowed to remove these terms. Otherwise, you would get uh, inconsistent correlation uh, uh, functions of all the identities. And, and anomalies are some other things that could appear on the right hand side in addition to these uh, 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 expected ones. And they include uh, the conventional anomalies, so, such as tidal anomalies, or trace anomalies, or more, re more recent ones studied in the literature, such as shortening anomalies, and so on and so on. So many important physical, physical information is in the contact terms. And so they are sometimes observable, like Chan Simon's counter contact terms. And in other situations, even though they can be removable, they may have some applications to real physics, such as the one that appears in the Dogeta cosmology. And, and in the Dogeta cosmology, people regard the conformal symmetry or approximate conformal, well, uh, people regard the expanding universe or inflationary universe as an approximate Dogeta symmetry. And then they are going to study the amplitudes, which is related to the CFT correlation functions. And there, uh, they are interested in the momentum space amplitudes or momentum space uh, correlation functions. And in the momentum space, the delta function or derivatives become uh, an analytic expression in terms of momentum. And they may dominate the entire amplitudes. And people, re people are expecting that you might find these uh, amplitudes in the sky. So, so let me talk about the conformal symmetries of local terms or semi-local terms or contact terms. A sample questions are like this. When are these two-point functions or three-point functions are conformal invariant? So you have delta functions on the right hand side or delta functions in addition to the semi uh, well some um, non-local expressions like this. So it's not uh, well, so so the question is how can we assure or how how can we how how, how do we know that under which condition these uh, contact terms or the data functions are consistent with conformal symmetry? Of course, you can always resort to your direct uh, brute force computation. You can always check uh, whether these uh, terms satisfy the conformal order identities by doing the brute force differentiation of these objects and compare with what you would expect on the transformation on the left hand side. But this is very cumbersome. If you have ever tried to check 
uh, a conformal symmetry of the three-point functions, and if we ever try to see what would be the most constraining uh, uh, condition that would come from the conformal invariance, you thought that it is a te tedious work, and you also thought that it is not eliminating at all. And there should be a better way. And indeed, there is a better way to understand the conformal invariance of polyvalent functions, and which is known as the embedding space formalism. And embedding space formalism means that you would like to study the d dimension for the d plus two dimensional space time instead of d dimensional space time that you are studied with. So this is based on the isomorphism of the algebra. Suppose you have this d dimensional conformal symmetry. S O D plus one comma D, and you immediately realize that this is the uh, D plus two dimensional Lorentz symmetry. So instead of considering D dimensional space time with D dimensional conformal symmetry, you start with a D plus two dimensional space time with D plus two dimensional Lorentz symmetry. Then you can write down the Lorentz invariant amplitude immediately in D plus two dimension. And then you can just reduce these amplitudes to d dimensions to get the conformal invariant uh, correlation functions d dimension. This is the idea of embedding space formalism people have been using over years to have the conformal invariant uh, correlation functions more explicitly. So I try to do the same thing in contact terms or with delta functions. And and the naive thing that you might want to do is to use the d plus two dimensional delta function. But this naive idea didn't work because the d plus two dimension has two extra delta functions compared with uh, the d dimensional delta function that you like to have. So this idea didn't work. But I <coughs> developed a technique to write down uh, the d dimensional delta function in terms of this d plus two dimensional variable, which is Lorentz invariant, by essentially integrating over extra two dimensions. And this is, uh, uh, well, this is mathematically known in the context of the projective geometry. And I'm not going into the details of this math here, but the point is that now I have a technique for uh, uh, the method to study the d plus two dimensional delta functions, or uh, the, the, the conformal invariant delta functions, by using this embedding space formalism, and then I can uh, talk about the conformal symmetries of uh, contact terms or semi local terms. So I just want to make the story, yeah. The capital D is yeah. the same as Modi or different? Which one? The capital D. Oh, capital D is a D plus 2. A D plus 2, okay. And what is K? K is actually an uh, arbitrary number. So, as I said, in D dimension, you have only one delta function. But in D plus two dimension, there are a series of delta functions that reduce to the same one. And so, and this is the trick. And this is a very important trick. Well, I'm not going to use it, but this is a very important trick in this embedding space formalism. So that, this is actually related to the fact that uh, in this expression, uh, delta, the sum of well, uh, well, this delta one can be different from delta two. And this difference is related to this k. So in, 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 in higher dimensions, or in d plus 2 dimensions, there are different ways to represent delta functions. In a, it, but reduces to the same delta functions d dimension. And this is, uh, well, this is how the different uh, conformal transformations of this left-hand side can be the same delta function d dimension. This is related to this uh, properties of well, these peculiar properties of delta function that would appear even if the uh, dimension of delta 1 is different from delta 2. Yes. Yes. The capital X and capital Y are both like-like vectors. Yes, eventually it will be a like-like vector. What do you mean by the x, y on the left hand side? Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. right. <coughs> First, you will treat x and y are not like that vectors and do this integration. And after that, you have to impose this condition. You take the option of OK, so I'm not going to use this. But I, 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 I really like this formula, but I, I, I'm not going to use this. But I'm 
in this talk, I'm going to discuss uh, the applications of these delta functions in uh, uh, conformal space to talk about a very peculiar anomalies that we have encountered over years. So this is just, uh, related to, to, to the trace anomaly in four dimension. And if you have a CFT in class space time, then the trace of the energy modern tensor is zero. But if you put your uh, CFT on the curved background in four dimension, you would get a non-trivial contribution from the background curvature. And since the energy modern tensor is dimension four, this must be the dimension four counter invariant on the right hand side. And this is the most uh, well, this is the uh, uh, most <coughs> this is the, the possibility that we will have on the right hand side. So you have this uh, usual wire scale term, the Euler density, and R squared, and box R and Pontiari. And, and there is some conditions that the trace anomaly must uh, meet, and one is the less minimal condition that says that this trace of the random tensor must be given by a variation of a non-local effective action. And this says that uh, among these five possibilities, C, A, and D, and E are all consistent. But B is not consistent in the sense that if you do any computations of a CFT on current background, you would never generate this R scatter in, as a trace anomaly. Where does that condition come from? I mean, Vesumino usually is a come from commutator of something. Yeah, so commutator of the wire anomaly and what? The commutator between two wire anomaly. That's your commutator. Two wire anomaly. Yeah, yeah. Two wire transformation? Variation of wire scale, but that wire scale is wide invariant. So the commutator is zero, it is consistent. And Pondrian is also consistent. But if you do the wire transformation R scale, then there's something. This does not satisfy the commuted relation of the wire anomaly for this commutator. If you do five transmissions twice, and then, well, it is a barrier. But this R square doesn't satisfy this uh, a barrier nature of the viral model. But other, other times, all do satisfy this basically. And this is and another point is that this D term is actually trivial in the sense that you can remove this R term by adding box R term, by adding the local character R square to the effective action. So this D, number D, is not uh, <coughs> universal with other than CFT, unless you, you have, uh, as long as you can add this counter term. So people usually do not talk about this D term as, a, as an interesting wire anomaly in four dimensions. And then we are left with C and A, A and E here. And you know that C anomaly and A anomaly in uh, conformal field theory plays a very important role. In particular, A dictates the number of degrees of freedom in your theory. And A, well, this is not A theorem. And, but the question we had some time ago is that what would be this D anomaly? Well, this was when we were chatting when we were students some time ago. And I and Mr. Tazuka was, uh, uh, talked about the possibility of this E anomaly. So this, well, for the term, uh, for reference, uh, is given by the Riemann tensor square, but contracted with only one epsilon tensor. And because we have only one epsilon tensor here, that the Pontryagin term is, has a different parity transformation compared with the other terms. And this means that uh, uh, the contrarian trace anomaly, if any, could only appear in a CT violating theory because uh, this contrarian term is CT odd, and this wire square is CT even, CT even, CT even, CT even. So, and usually, the energy of the tensor is CT even. So, unless you have a CT violating theory, you will never get this contrarian term. And this is crucial. So, in many conformal field of theories that you know the CP is not broken. Uh, every free theory has no, no CP violation. So if you do one loop computation, you will never get it. And when I wrote a paper in 2012, I concluded, therefore, that there is no known examples of CP violating contrarian trace anomaly. 
And it could be non productively generated based on the philosophy that everything that can happen do happen in theory, in, in theoretical physics. But there is an interesting observation I made at the point. So I looked at examples of the Pontiani trace anomaly in the literature, and I realized there, there is a couple of interesting papers. One interesting paper is a one by Chris Pensen and Gunn, which was the, one of the earliest uh, papers on conformal anomaly studied. Mm -hmm. And they computed what is called the salient weak field coefficient for a various uh, representation of SO4, Lorentz group or Euclidean group, by using the heat kernel method. And they quoted the following formula for Euclidean wire fermion which is in the one half gamma zero representation of SO4. And they have this formula. They have Euler density and wire scale as usual. But they also have this point line term. And this was interesting because this, well, usually we associate this theory with the coefficients with trace anomaly. And then if you could identify this as a, as a, as a, uh, as a trace anomaly, you would get the point line trace anomaly from a Euclidean wire pyramid. And this was very confusing, you know, and, 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 and I have something to say at the, toward the end of the talk. But I found this uh, reference, and, and, and I thought then this is consistent, so this, there, there is a possibility to have a point line trace anomaly. Later, a couple of years later, Onura and his collaborators, who are experts in uh, probability anomalies, they claimed that the same value of this uh, Euclidean value perineum would be obtained in the Minkowski signature as well by using, by computing the direct one loop uh, amplitudes of T mu mu, T alpha beta, and T of sigma, like this. And they wrote a couple of series of papers to back up their claim. But there are other guys who say that the computation by Bonora in his is is not, not correct. And then Bonora claimed back that the realization used by the other guys are not correct. <laughs> <laughs> and there should be some, uh, some difference between Bayer-Kelly and Bayer-Kelly. And then they even wrote uh, a very recent paper on the last September. And uh, it sounds very controversial. I'm not going to talk about the controversy uh, in, in more detail, but I have, I'm more interested in the structures of contrarian trace anomaly, if any. Is there anything special about this contrarian trace anomaly, or is it uh, just the usual anomaly that you could have? Well, actually, this contrarian trace anomaly is a very interesting anomaly in the following sense. So this is the concept I just made up so-called impossible anomaly, and the name may be seen, but there are two distinct structures of anomalies in conformal field. And to explain this, let me begin with the conventional anomaly, in which, well, so let me take an example of the three uh, current correlation functions in CFT, so which will eventually become anomalous. But uh, the, if you compute, the current correlation functions, current three-point functions in, in coordinate space, usually you get non-local expressions in x, y, and z. And what we mean by anomaly is that you are going to take the divergence of one current, JMU for example, and then you compute whether this is zero or not. Well, certainly it is, it is non-zero somewhere to get no anomaly, to get anomaly, but where do we get non-zero result? Well, in the usual anomaly, what you get is that uh, this uh, divergence-free condition is all, 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 almost true, but for a particular coincident point. Or in other words, you have the contact terms on the right hand side. This is how the current uh, conservation is broken in anomalous scale. So this is usual anomaly. So that this is what we usually do. And this is how, I, how we uh, uh, compute the anomaly in CFP. <coughs> But what I mean by impossible anomaly is quite different. So again, you eventually get the anomalous equations like this. And, but the point is that in the case of the impossible anomaly, there is no parent three-point functions that are, that, are, that are supported in the local anomaly. 
only you could get in the case of the impossible anomaly is that the three-point function is semi-local for compact terms. So you start it with semi-local expressions like this, and then you take the divergence and you get this, but this expression is not supported in a, in a non-local function of x, y, and c. So the contrary anomaly is this type. So consider the three-point functions, t mu nu, t alpha beta, and t rho sigma. And, and the contrary anomaly is related to the three-point functions in one trace here. And then uh, the right-hand side is non-zero. So, so if, you, if, you have a, if, you have, if you don't have anomaly, this must be zero, because you, this means a value invariance. But if you have a non-zero result, this shows the anomaly. And this anomaly here is a, a proportional Dixon tensor and some contact terms like this. And if you get anything like this in your theory, this would mean that we have the contrary trace anomaly. And, and one can check whether this amplitude or this correlation function is consistent with conformal symmetry by using the embedding space formalism, like I, I invented. But it, well, whatever you do, you get this uh, uh, amplitude itself is consistent. But the point is that the reason why I call this impossible anomaly is that uh, you can show that this three point function does not have a uh, parity violating term in a non local way. So the best thing we could do is to have a semi-local term in the three-point function. And then that would reduce this amplitude after taking the trace. What is the meaning of the semi-local? Semi-local means that uh, turns like this. We <coughs> have one delta function, and then a non-local. So, and, 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 and well, if you have non-local term, every, every, well, there is a, there, at everywhere, almost everywhere, you have a support for this three point function. But semi local means that you, you need at least two of the uh, arguments must coincide to get non zero result. And, and in order to get well, the conformal symmetry, shows that uh, these uh, three point functions that will give you this trace anomaly is not supported by non local function, but it's only supported by semi local. <coughs> It is not that obvious if the anomaly coming from the entire contact terms are semi-local terms are physical, because there are some situations that the contact terms in conformal uh, uh, on the, uh, energy contact tensor may play an important role. For example, uh, we have studied, or uh, Maldasena and Mendel showed that the energy momentum tensor two-point function in CFT may have an uh, unknown uh, two contact term two-point functions that will break the parity, and they even claim that you may be able to find this amplitude in the sky by having uh, this DS or cosmology GFT correspondence. And I can also write down the effective action for the contrary trace anomaly, like the Dirachman effective action, or the Liu action, that will eventually, that after integrating out phi in a normal way, then this will give you the the, the, the uh, uh, trace anomaly. And the existence of such effective action really means that the contrary trace anomaly is consistent. But the question is whether you can really find it in, in, the, in the actual theory, because it, is, it seems very unlikely to have this impossible type anomaly, at least as far as we know. And, and coming back to the, the question, or the original uh, uh, the finding by uh, by by Duff and Chris Jensen, they do they did the bundled computation for a nuclear wire fermion, and they well, they didn't do the bundled computation, but they showed that the Seyfried Witte coefficient, which is mathematically de very defined for a nuclear wire fermion, does show this contrary term on the right hand side. But the question is question was whether we could identify this as a trace anomaly, because uh, if you have only one Euclidean wire fermion in four dimension, in four Euclidean, four dimension Euclidean signature, this theory does not have a proper energy momentum tensor. This theory is very chiral, and for, if you have the, the partner of zero comma one half representation, you are never, you will never get the energy moment tensor. So it is not obvious whether you can identify this uh, accelerated with B coefficient 
as a trace anomaly. And there is no polynomial functions to be computed in this Euclidean area. So this is, well, this, this is consistent with that uh, there is no local expression, no local expression for the large mountain tensor three-point functions. And, but the question remains whether we should really regard this as a trace or not. So <coughs> let me summarize my talk. So what I showed is that the contact terms in CFT may be physically important and interesting. And to study the contact terms, then there is a, uh, now I have an embedding space formalism to deal with this uh, data functions in the formal space side. And I have discussed uh, well, I, I have just reviewed a recent debate on the Pontryagi trace anomaly, and I'm studying the switch generalization of the Pontryagi anomaly recently with a student of mine. And, and in their case, the Pontryagi the existence of the Pontryagi trace anomaly means that the central charge C in the switch context will be complexified. And there is a, a further a possible generation of the other current trace anomaly. And uh, so please stay tuned, and we will hear about the super contrary trace anomaly in the next year conference. <laughs> so thank you very much. Excuse me? What about But in three dimension, at, at least from the curvature alone, there is no trace anomaly because in three dimension, <coughs> the trace of the moon must have uh, dimension three, and there is no good uh, candidate for trace anomaly in three. <coughs> Chan Simon's term. But no, actually no, because Chan Simon's term, if you integrate, if you just integrate Chan Simon's term, it is the of the variant. But in the trace anomaly, you have to multiply the y factor. Uh, the, uh, the, effect, uh, the way it appears is that well, what, what we really appears is this, this T mu mu multiplied by y factor sigma <coughs> of x is a function of space time. And if you insert the function of space time with a uh, uh, Simon's term, then this will no longer be a different motion invariant. So it's not that, it's not allowed. But if you have other I mean, uh, background, like scalar background, then there will be other terms.
So the in the, in the simple gravity, uh, I mean the, 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 the gravity multiple metric and the uh, uh, gauge field for the R current yeah. becomes in the same multiple. Yeah, so once yeah, you introduce yeah, 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 but uh, very nicely thinking uh, so it is still the term is a topological term yeah. and uh, so the coupling to gravity is a is a metric independent. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, but uh, that's uh, the last formula says that, uh, well, anyway, if it's still like coupled to background metric. <coughs> coupled to, well, but, but I don't, I'm not sure I'm, I, I'm answering your question very precisely, but contrary terms also are topological terms, and all the other things is also topological terms. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the, well, the, Exactly. Once, once again, what do you mean by, by the last formula? Uh, yeah, well, this is part of it. This is not the entire of it. part of the trace anomaly. Which theory do you consider? I have, well, I'm considering the super symmetric field theory with contrary trace anomaly. What I claim is that if the theory, super symmetric theory, has a contrary trace anomaly, at the same time, you should get the uh, trace anomaly, which is proportional to the field. Here, F is a background gauge field for the iron uh, symmetry. Next question. So you're saying that when the contrary trace anomaly exists, the central charge will be complexified. Yes. Is it OK to have complexified central charge? Well, it's like, uh, I mean, I mean in, in, in either case theory, tau becomes complexified, right? Sorry? Tau, or gauge coupling constant is complexified. Right. right. And, and, and here, uh, the coupling to the uh, y multiple is complexified. Right. Usually, the only constant the case is um, yeah. with, with, with real C. Yeah. But now. The term is about demand, the central charge real, right? Well. It's not always the case. Oh. Well, I should also I should have also added that A will never become complexified. Oh, okay. If, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. There is a structure that, that the A uh, is I never see. complexified. C is complexified. Okay. Uh,